Hello friends, welcome to another edition of BJJ Meditations. This is BJJ Meditations number 20. Wow, BJJ Meditations. Almost old enough to drink if episodes were years, which they are not. At the risk of this becoming in uh, sort of my log of injuries, last Tuesday I talked a little bit about uh, an ankle injury that I received from a certain Emily Kwok as she gets ready for pans. This week it was a very aggressive white belt in our gym with some MMA experience who hit me with some sort of a um, spastic takedown attempt that uh, tore up my right ankle, which was just finally starting to feel normal after an ankle lock mishap back in November. But such is the life of a grappler, right? Especially the middle-aged grappler. Um, this week's BJJ Meditations is about revelations, not in the biblical sense, but also in the biblical sense. Don't worry, I'm not going to uh, turn this into some sort of tent revival type thing. Uh, you'll see what I mean. And I guess what's kind of been top of mind for this week is this revelation of limitations, aging. I tend to get injured now, and it's not the immediate bounce back that I was accustomed to in my 20s. It's definitely a slower resolution now, more protracted resolution. It takes effort to heal these things, time, effort, money. Uh, and jiu-jitsu, among the many things it reveals to you, it reveals your physical limitations. And I guess let's see what else jiu-jitsu can reveal to us. This is BJJ Meditations number 20, Jiu-Jitsu's Apocalypse. Jiu-jitsu is a revelation, as in... The art reveals truths about ourselves and others with near-biblical potency and profundity. I mean this literally. The Book, of the Book of Revelations takes its name from the first word of the Koine Greek version. That word is apocalypsis, meaning unveiling or revelation. Apocalypse is a loaded word today in the West. We hear it and we think destruction, cataclysm, demise. We forget the example of Shiva, that rebirth follows death. We forget that rebirth follows death, even though we practice that cycle again and again when we train. When we tap, we simulate death. We submit to the inevitable. The choke applied too long starves the brain of precious oxygen, and the light of our personhood is permanently extinguished, perhaps. Fortunately, we can tap and start again. As far as we know, we don't get the same fresh start when the ultimate apocalypsis the ultimate unveiling comes. With each simulated death and each fresh life on the mats, we're given a chance to learn from our errors, whether those errors are technical or tactical or something deeper, something psychological, moral, or spiritual. But the apocalypsis, the unveiling, the revelation only comes from the surrender. That requires a great deal of courage, especially in a life that demands endless perfection. So many of us cannot fail, though our failure is constant. We deny the apocalypsis. We think we know, but instead, we need to be knowing with a capital K to experience the unveiling with a capital U. Yeah, so BJJ can reveal a lot of things about us, and we can see those revelations exclusively within the confines of jiu-jitsu itself meaning we can look at technical and tactical revelations. Maybe our approach to playing a certain guard is incorrect. Maybe our technique is incorrect or could be refined. But as with all BJJ meditations related things, I like to take these concepts and apply them more abstractly and thematically to life. So we can look at what we do on the mats and we can extrapolate from there what those actions say about who we are as a person. Um, since this is kind of a one-man band, I guess I'll talk a little bit about what BJJ has revealed to me about me. Uh, I would say white belt to purple belt, the extent of my BJJ revelations, uh, the large extent of my BJJ revelations reveal, revolved around this theme of surrender. And I touch, I touch on it a little bit in this essay. There's the literal surrender in the role of tapping. When you tap, you say, I submit. You're essentially saying, if you kept doing this thing that you're doing to me right now, you would either kill me or 
damage my body in such a way that it would be irreparable or very hard to come back from. So there's that literal surrender. There's also this metaphorical surrender that takes place within that literal surrender. Let me explain what that means a little bit. So grappling. When we say grappling, we can look at that term literally. We are grappling with another person. We're trying to lay hands on them, come to grips with them, and eventually submit them, put them in some sort of physically submissive position where we have the upper hand, right? So we could also look at that sort of metaphorically. We're constantly grappling with elusive, difficult, slippery concepts or situations in our life. And sometimes we can come to grips with these situations and we can make them bend to our will. And other times we just can't, right? Uh, it's the problem of like a game of incomplete information and a problem of a game where so many of the, the quote unquote players are agents that are completely outside of our control. Uh, there are people and forces at work in life that we just cannot account for. So, so much of that agency is present in jujitsu. Like we're dealing with another human being who's capable of making decisions and acting, and maybe they have certain strengths or proclivities that are advantageous that we don't have. And so much of the game of jujitsu, just like so much of the game of life, is just submitting to those things, to letting those things go, saying that this person is bigger, stronger, faster than me. So if I want to, if I want to win here, I need to not race them. I need to not try and overpower them. I need to, I need to cede the ground that they control to them and try and find something more advantageous. Uh, I think there's something paradoxical to this because jujitsu in of itself and life in of itself is kind of this exercise in control sometimes. And truly control comes from surrender in many instances. We can win the match by surrendering the game in the games that we can't win. And we can win in, in to a certain extent in life when we surrender these things that we have zero control over. So jujitsu really taught this to me in a way that I could never fully understand if I were just to sit here and conceptualize these things. Uh, Jiu-jitsu, like, it's an embodied game. We play a lot of games in life. Uh, and life, to me, is sort of this meta game. But more so and more so, the games that we play are these abstract games. They're cognitive games. We, we live a whole lot up here now. And the rest of this amazing uh, body that we have, soul, spirit, psyche, all of these things, these slippery things that are kind of weird to talk about, they're useful instruments for navigating our way through life. And their, their sensitivity is becoming less and less attuned the more we play these exclusively intellectual games. So jujitsu breaks that down. It says, okay, you need to bring all of your forces to bear on solve, to solve this problem. It needs to be an intellectual activity. And for a while, it's mostly an intellectual activity. When you know nothing, when you're a white belt, you're holding on to whatever few constructs and strategies you know. So for me, it was cross-collar choke. Like I'm going to try to cross-collar choke you wherever, wherever we are. Even if we're in a position that doesn't make any sense, it's the one thing I know and I'm constantly thinking and reaching for it. But eventually, you get more adept at the game and the other systems start to come online too. Uh, you become more kinesthetically aware. You become more somatically aware. Your proprioception kicks in. It gets to a point where you know where your partner is without having to lay eyes on them. And you're... You've developed all these other systems of awareness, these bodily systems of awareness, and then that submission can truly happen. You can let go of all these things you can't control. You can focus on playing your own game and less on scrambling to keep up with your opponent's game. And that's when the magic of the revelation starts to happen, I think, because you're breaking through to that next layer of revelation. So there's always something more to be learned about yourself. So like right now I have, I've, I've kind of worked through this as a brown belt. I've worked through this need to truly dominate rounds. Like I can let go of things. Things can go off script. Magical things can happen in the role, in the scramble. Uh, things that I couldn't plan for if I even wanted to. It's, it's much like this, con this one-sided conversation I'm having with you right now. Like I, none of this is scripted. I'm just kind of rolling with things as they unfold so 
the things can take on a life of their own. And then the next revelation that comes up after that initial revelation is, is the revelation that I'm experiencing right now is, so what are the conditions that are conducive to being in this state of flow? How can I conjure that up in other aspects of my life? Well, professionally, okay, so what am I trying to control in my work life right now? Am I agonizing so much over the fact that um, my revenue projections aren't tracking with where I want them to be this month? And am I so locked into that? Am I so focused on that thing? Am I so determined to pin it down and earn more money that I'm missing these other opportunities? I'm not, I'm not seeing the other opportunities as they emerge. They're just going right by in the periphery because I'm so focused on this one aspect of the problem that I'm trying to control. Uh, and so I guess you kind of, you get my point there, but it kind of begs the question of like, how do you, how do you train this? What does it look like in practice on the mat? Uh, so when I was trying to call, to train this thematically, uh, this, this idea of submitting, of letting go, of welcoming in what the revelation might be. Uh, I was trying to spend as much time in transition as possible. I did this throughout Purple Bell, and I'm doing it again now. It's something I'm really making a commitment to do in my training, because I, as I just described that business example, that's a real-life example. Uh, and I think this is going to ultimately bear a beneficial solution for me. So what I'll do is I'll be training with somebody especially if it's somebody who's maybe just below my skill level and I will have a timer in my, my head. I'll count to 10 and I'll change the position. I'll count to 20 and I'll change the position. And it doesn't matter where I am. I could be in mount. I could have the most dominant position possible. I could have control of someone's back and I'm just going to let that go. Uh, I'm, if, <laughs> if I'm training with somebody and uh, they're, they're only slightly less skilled than me, I'm not going to do it in such a way where it's ins insulting, where I'm like, I'm giving away this position, um, but I'm not striving so hard to hold on. The goal is to spend as much time in transition as possible and kind of see what alchemizes in that moment. Uh, but so I guess the, the meta theme of all this is that you need to be willing to go there. And many of us, this is very, very hard because we're raised in this in this society that demands perfection. Uh, there's there's nothing less than almost in a crushing demand to succeed and to win at all costs and to be perceived as a winner and a success. And this is just endemic to life with social media. I think writ large, uh, it's very hard to resist that temptation and that and that drive. Um, you know, I see this, one of, one of the sports that I truly love, in addition to jiu-jitsu, I've become a, a big fan of Formula One racing. And uh, last weekend's race, I believe it was in Jeddah, was, really illustrates this point. So right now, Red Bull is one of the most dominant teams and has been one of the most dominant teams in, Red, in uh, recent years in Formula One. And um, this week, Max Verstappen, who is like Red Bull's star driver, had a, I want to I say it was... Um, I want to say it was like a drivetrain issue during time trials. And he ended up qualifying and starting the race in 15th place. So it's like 20 drivers, pretty much as far back as you can be. Um, he came back over the course of a race that was like 54 laps or something like that and ended up finishing in second. And not only did he finish in second, but he had the fastest lap of the day. But he lost to his teammate, Sergio Perez. And there was this very tense moment after the race before they did the podium where Sergio Perez and Max Verstappen were like kind of comparing notes. And you could just see in Sergio Perez's face that it didn't matter that he just decisively won this race. Like it was his race from lap three and he never, he never surrendered the lead. He was just furious that Max had a lap that was faster than him. And then Max, Max it seemed like he may as well have been in last place. Like it didn't matter to him that he had this amazing comeback race. All he cared about was that he didn't win. And, you know, to be fair, I think that's the drive that makes any athlete elite, right? But I'm not an elite athlete. <laughs> I don't pretend to be. 
and I don't aspire to be. I, I train jujitsu to be good at jujitsu, yes, but to sort of bring this level of equilibrium throughout my life writ large. It's, it's much bigger than jujitsu, my reason for training. Uh, so to reap that benefit, you really need to be willing to let go and to fail and to fail gloriously and spectacularly and to be okay with the second place finish, to be okay with that last place finish, to be okay with surrendering the fastest lap of the day and to not be okay with those things. Yeah, you know, you're not going to come home with the gold medal every single time, but if you're optimizing for life bounds in jiu-jitsu, life lessons in jiu-jitsu, then that sort of attitude nullifies the revelation. You unfortunately will, I don't want to say never see it, but it's going to be much harder to see it. It's tough. It's one of the hardest things about this sport, and I think it's one of the reasons why so many people just don't even make it to blue belt. They just can't deal with sucking so badly for so long. Uh, but if you can open yourself to being so bad for so long, the good that comes from that, the revelation that comes from that is transformative. So I guess this is the point in the show where I do a little begging and I'm here to beg you. Well, I don't really beg you. I'm not that desperate, guys. Things are all right here. But if you would be so kind uh, as to subscribe to BJJ Meditations on whatever podcast platform you're listening to this on, or if you're watching it on YouTube, please subscribe. Regardless of where you are, if you could also review, that would be fantastic. And share with somebody who might benefit from this. As I said last episode, it might be a grappler who would benefit from this. It might be somebody who's never even tried jiu-jitsu, but I think that you're all here because jiu-jitsu has transformed your life in some way and you see the transformative potential of the sport. And if we can help other people through this martial art in the same way that it has helped us, then the more the merrier. Bring them in. Uh, as far as supporting BJJ meditations goes, it will always be free. I will never compromise on that. If you want to throw some scratch my way, then the best way to do it is to go to mirror, mirror.xyz. Um, the link is in the show notes. It's a long link. Uh, but Mirror is a, it's a blogging platform that's on the Ethereum blockchain. And all of these meditations, the part that I read, the part that I don't ad lib, they are small essays that I publish on Mirror. And they're available as NFTs. Uh, now is kind of an interesting time in the crypto market. I'm not here to shill crypto to you either. Frankly, I'm skeptical about crypto. I don't even know if I'm going to be on Mirror long term. But I will say this: it's a hyperinflationary market. Uh, we don't know what the Fed's going to do. Regional banks are closing. Um, I'm happy that I have some of my money in crypto. This is not this is not like a financial advice. I'm not a financial advisor, um, but. I think that it's worth kind of being aware of what this technology is and what it does. And uh, it's just a very low stakes way for you to get involved. You could, if you want to, you could go on Mirror and you could buy an NFT of an essay that you like, support the podcast, learn a little bit about crypto in the process, or don't. Totally fine. If you think it's a scam, I don't know. It might be a scam. Once again, I'm open to the revelation here. Uh, I'm also open to the possibility that uh, it might be right. So, hence, here we are at BJJ Meditations grappling with the economic question of crypto. Is it the future? I don't know. Anyway, if you like my writing, you could also find me on Substack. That's where I write more about these thematic, life-centered things. Uh, that comes out every other week. I don't spam you in any way whatsoever. That's also free. And uh, yeah, if you like what I am saying here, you, you might like that too. Love it if you could subscribe. Again, link for that is in the bio. And then finally, or in the show notes rather, and then finally Instagram, BJJ underscore meditations on Instagram. Uh, that's sort of like the single source of truth for all happenings, BJJ meditations. If you want to keep up with the show or keep up with me, um, that's the place to go. If you want to keep up with me, I'm jhannon86 on Instagram. You can see all the weird things I have going on in my life. BJJ meditations is exclusive BJJ meditation stuff. But yeah. You think that about, to quote the big Lebowski, you think that about does her, wraps her up. Um, it's fun talking to you, as always. Um, hit me up, you know. 
shoot me some DMs on Instagram, slide into the old DMs. Really interested to know what's on your mind, how this show is working for you, anything I can do different, better. Uh, I would love to know what BJJ has revealed to you about yourself or about human nature. So tell me, please. I, I just, it's lonely here. It's just me, just talking to myself like a schizophrenic in my office. You know, I've been thinking maybe I should do some of these like on the mat so you guys can see that I actually do train. I do. You can see my ears just destroyed. Um, I swear I'm not some sham. And speaking of training, if you ever do want to train with me, uh, I train at Princeton Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu in Princeton, New Jersey. We love guests. doesn't matter what your affiliation is. Just come out and train. Train smart. You know, don't hurt anybody. Uh, but yeah, I would love to see you. love to train with you. And uh, yeah, catch you next week. Thanks, everybody.